Minister, um, I've reached March 1983. I should just say in terms of timing for today, obviously this is material that needs to be looked at carefully and I'm not proposing to, to rush through any of it. There are fewer documents to look at once we get beyond to 1984 um, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, but whether we get on to the Oxford presentation today or not, I'm, I'm not at the present confident one way or another. We'll see how matters go. A lot of the documents being referred to today are documents in common with the Oxford material, um, because obviously Dr. Bloom and Dr. Ritzer were working very closely together at this time. But I just thought I'd provide that update um, for those who are listening both here and uh, remotely. Well, thank you very much. The, sir, 23rd of March 1983, Professor Bloom attended a meeting of the CBLA, um, the Central Blood Laboratory Authority. Uh, I'm not going to go to the minutes of that meeting because they say very little of um, relevance in relation to Professor Bloom other than he suggested that the CBLA should discuss AIDS at a future meeting. But we do get an insight into the meeting from a note prepared by Dr Lane of BPL. Henry, could we have CBLA... 301691, please. Um, this is an internal note from Dr. Lane, uh, dated the 24th of March 1983, um, and we see he says, Professor Bloom drew the attention of the CBLA at their meeting on Wednesday, the 23rd of March. Sorry, drew to the attention of the CBLA the problems that are becoming associated with blood transfusion and blood product administration with the increasing incidence of reported AIDS cases, which continues to gain momentum in the United States on a monthly basis. The high mortality in reported cases is a cause for concern and is a primary factor behind what is described as the American overreaction to the problem. The etiological factor or factors remain unknown. Pausing there, sir. This reads as though Dr. Lane is uh, recounting what Professor Bloom had told the meeting. So the description of an American overreaction, uh, and of course Professor Bloom had received the letter from Bruce Evert by this time, m seems likely to have been Professor Bloom's, but we can't be entirely confident. The, the minutes themselves contain no reference to this issue. The note continues, Professor Bloom will continue to keep the authority informed. Dr. Gumpson will be attending a Council of Europe meeting in April where the implications of AIDS on the plasma collection and fractionation programme will be dealt with. The panel of experts will determine what advice should be given to blood transfusionists and special user groups in Europe. This advice will be reported back to the authority. Meanwhile, patients potentially at risk in the United Kingdom, notably haemophiliacs, are evidently concerned and resistance against the use of imported American coagulation factor concentrates is becoming apparent. Equally, there is a likelihood that a return to cryoprecipitate as a desirable form of treatment may become irresistible, whether logical or not. It, whether that is Dr. Lane's own view or his recounting Professor Bloom's is unclear. The next paragraph, however, it seems fairly clearly to be D Dr. Lane's uh, proposal. It is necessary for this laboratory, i.e. BPL, to develop a policy which may only be implemented on a short-term basis which will allow for the presentation of a large proportion of NHS factor VIII as cryoprecipitate. Staff will be aware that many regional transfusion centres have not made wet cryoprecipitate for some time and would now be both out of practice and in some cases without the facilities to recommence large-scale production. The implications for BPL source material are very real. And then there's a, a suggestion of setting up a meeting to discuss this issue. Um, Moving to April of 1983, and of course by this time the FDA in the States on the 24th of March has issued its directive about ceasing to collect and fractionate plasma from donors in high-risk groups. We then, in April, see further contact from pharmaceutical companies with Professor Bloom. Henry, could we have BAYP 5028 underscore 076, please? We can see this is um, uh, a letter from a, it's from a cutter sales representative. Um, Dear Professor Bloom, further to our discussion on the 30th of March, we don't have any further details of that discussion, I'm writing to confirm our position with regards to AIDS. 
Cut has instituted new screening procedures for the selection of plasma donors, and, and details of that are there set out. And then he says, um, further down the letter, you can be assured that Qatar has intensively involved its people and resources in following all AIDS developments, and we are in virtually constant communication with responsible health authorities. Uh, and then there's an offer of responding to any further queries Professor Bloom may have. Um, we, we then, still in April 1983, um, see that Professor Bloom gave a talk to the Haemophilia Society's AGM. And we have details of that in PRSE 40411. This is a, a copy of the Haemophilia Society's bulletin, the 2nd of 1983. Uh, um, uh, it's, um, the precise date of publication is unclear, but it, it's, it's um, either the middle or, or, or second half of 1983 seems likely but it reproduces the text of Professor Bloom's talk. So if we go, please, Henry, to the second page. Um, and if we could just zoom in a little more, please. Thank you. So we can see talk given at the AGM, 23rd of April, 1983, Professor A.L. Bloom. The title of the talk is Home Therapy, Myth or Reality? Um, and we can see he deals both with um, uh, practices in relation to home therapy and, and with the issue of AIDS. Um, so picking it up in the first paragraph, a few lines down, he says, um, one of my tasks this afternoon is to explain why home therapy appears to be real. I shall outline some of the logistic and medical problems which may impart a mythical connotation to what is otherwise real. He then explains ab about how he started to treat patients um, in the early 1960s, mostly with fresh frozen plasma, uh, then refers to um, the late Dr. Judith Poole's development of cryoprecipitate and how that was enthusiastically adopted. For the first time, treatment of haemophilia A at any rate was readily amenable to straight intravenous injection therapy and on-demand treatment at haemophilia centers expanded rapidly. Although storage of cryoprecipitate requires deep freeze facilities and it is relatively inconvenient to use, it was successfully adopted for home therapy programs for example, by the late Dr. Catherine Dormandy at the Royal Free Hospital and at several other centres. Uh, and then um, uh, he goes on to talk about the uh, um, uh, advent of freeze-dried uh, preparations. Under the heading, a bit further down the page, please, Henry, Home Therapy in the UK. We'll pick it up towards the bottom of that column. The reality of the situation with regard to home treatment is, in fact, that just under half the patients with haemophilia A and B or B are now established on home treatment programs, and the number of patients treated has uh, now leveled out. Uh, he then goes on to describe the sort of treatment that's available for home treatment and says this, we see that cryoprecipitate accounts for only a small proportion of material used for treatment. About half of the freeze-dried factor eight concentrates are used at home for about half uh, of uh, the patients. Uh, and goes on to discuss home treatment for von Willebrand's. Um, and then if we go to the top of the right-hand column, please, Henry, under the heading Drawbacks. Does the introduction into the circulation of all these blood derivatives have drawbacks? Whilst there's no doubt of the immediate benefit of treatment in terms of daily quality of life and the maintenance of joint function, what about the less beneficial effects? We're all familiar with the possibility of immediate reactions, but these do not pose major problems. And then skipping over a sentence, he says, however, the problems of hepatitis, factor VIII inhibitor, and the newly described acquired immune deficiency syndrome pose special risks, although not specifically related to home treatment. And towards the bottom of that paragraph, he refers to the number of patients with overt acute hepatitis remaining remarkably constant at about 2 to 3 percent, but there is increasing evidence that more insidious signs of chronic inflammation of the liver are much more common. And there's reference to a survey of that problem underway by the Hepatitis Working Party. And then if we can go further down, please, Henry, under the heading Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, he says this. I cannot end without a comment on one new problem, which may turn out to be the greatest myth or the most significant reality of all. I refer to the recently described and publicized Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. Uh, he then refers to how it was first um, recognized. If we could go to the next page, please, Henry.
Um, if we pick it up uh, in the left-hand column, bottom half of the page, um, he refers uh, to, in 1982, the condition being reported in a few haemophiliac patients in the USA. By February 1983, 13 cases have been reported amongst American haemophiliacs, only one of whom was an admitted homosexual. Eight of these patients have since died. I am unaware of any definite cases in British haemophiliacs, so I just ask you to note that and bear in mind the date. This is 23rd of April 1983, and we'll, we'll look at, in a little while at what we know of the first reported case in the UK, which was a Cardiff case under Professor Bloom. Um, but he says, I'm unaware of any definite cases in British haemophiliacs, and th the use of definite may be deliberate. Although cases are occurring in British homosexuals, it's rumoured that one of these has haemophilia. Then he refers to a survey being conducted by the Haemophilia Centre Directors Organisation. Um, uh, he refers at the bottom of the page to um, uh, physicians turning their attention to the healthy haemophilia uh, population. Um, and then at the very bottom of that, he says, it's probable that like most newly described disorders, less severe or early forms, if you go to the top of the next column, Henry, will be detected. Many research products are underway in attempts to elucidate the extent of these changes. And then he says this, what is the cause of the disorder? This is still quite unknown. It could simply be a reaction on the part of our immunity mechanisms to the long-term infusions of other people's plasma proteins. Perhaps there is some unknown constituent of blood products which is responsible, but the occurrence of the condition in homosexuals, drug addicts, immigrants from tropical climes, and in recipients of blood, uh, blood products makes the transmission of an infective agent the most likely cause. Uh, then he poses the question, how should we react to this development? Um, and says this, it's worth reflecting that 13 cases amongst 20,000 haemophiliacs in the USA means only one expected case amongst 2,000 haemophiliacs in the UK. Again, pausing there, so you may wish to consider in due course whether that is an error of reasoning. Uh, well, it, it's comparing actual cases with expected cases, yes. which is not a proper comparison, is it? Uh, well, sir, that's a matter for your judgment, but that is a reasonable inference that you may wish to draw. Well, I, I, in due course, if I'm wrong on that, I can be persuaded otherwise. Um, uh, uh, he then um, uh, set, makes the point that evidence from the incidence of hepatitis does not lead one to believe that concentrates prepared from British blood are naturally ne necessarily safer in this latter respect, at least. Although it's prudent to keep an open mind, the use of factor concentrates has revolutionised the lives of many sufferers from haemophilia A and B, and it does not seem reasonable to curtail treatment uh, at the present time. There's then a question and answer session, um, which we see beginning um, in the right-hand column, uh, under the heading Annual General Meeting 1983 Question and Answer Time, involving Professor Bloom, Dr. Forbes, Sister Fountain, and the Reverend Alan Tanner. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of it, but there's a discussion about home treatment. There's discussion about prophylaxis. Um, if we could then go, please, to the next page, Henry. So, in fact, could we go to the, the, the following page? My apologies one after that. Um, picking it up halfway down the left-hand column, there's a member of the audience who refers to a BBC Horizon programme on AIDS. Um, uh, and Professor Bloom says this, it is unfortunate that haemophilia has been linked with AIDS. Apart from that, we must not overlook the AIDS problem. One of my patients may have a mild form of it. So that's it a reference to um, what I'll refer to um, for, for present purposes as the Cardiff case, um, w without obviously identifying any patients by name. Um, some patients show laboratory changes. Laboratory changes do not mean it's a serious disease. I do not know of any haemophiliac with AIDS in the UK, France, or Germany. I do not think we need to get over-concerned about this. At the present time, it would be absolutely wrong to curtail treatment. So just pausing there, it, the position in relation to Germany may require a little further explanation. There were cases reported by this time in Germany, but it's not clear that Professor Bloom would have known that in April. Um, he would have known it 
um, um, w probably within a matter of weeks, but he wouldn't necessarily have known it at this time. And we don't know one way or another. And then if we go to the top of the next column, please. Where Professor Bloom says this, the concern has been that the concern has been that transmission has been from blood or blood products. The relevance is whether the transmission of this disease is by blood and associated blood products. That is what it's concerned with. If it is a transfusable agent, it is strange that it's not happened in Western Europe. They are only assuming that it's transferable by blood. Not everybody who gets blood will get the disease. So it, it maybe thought there a degree of reassurance being given, that whether it's a correct reassurance will be a matter for, for you to consider to, to those in the audience um, who are um, uh, listening. Um, and then I just note further down that column, there's a reference then below the picture um, to hepatitis, uh, where Professor Bloom says there's no such thing as a hepatitis-free concentrate. The concentrates must be handled with care. Um, whilst we're still looking at this document, uh, I'll just ask you to note, if we go on to, I think it's probably page 11, Henry. There's an article um, on AIDS by Dr. Pinching, who is an immunologist at St. Mary's Medical School. It, it continues on to the next page. Uh, but his view... Um, uh, is that whilst there are many other suggested causes, th that AIDS is due to an infectious agent transmitted by um, intimate product contact or blood product inoculation seems the most likely. And he goes on to discuss that in his article. Um, what, what, uh, what does he say at the bottom of the page there? Dr. Pinching. What the particular problem is, the last sentence, how does that follow on? Um, so he says, a particular problem is that there appears to be quite a long period, months or years, between exposure to the causative agent and the person becoming ill during the time he slash she may be infectious. Thank you. Uh, and he goes on to discuss the disease um, carrying with it a high mortality rate. Um, there's a further CBLA meeting in, in late April 1983. The discussion there is, is um, um, r relatively broad in nature. Um, uh, it's said that regional transfusion directors have been, had considered all the American literature. Um, uh, oh, oh, in fact, no, we will go to it because there is a comment from Professor Bloom that's worth noting. Sorry, Henry. It's CBLA 301702. So we can see the date, Central Blood Laboratories Authority, minutes 27th of April 1983. We can see that Professor Bloom is there. If we go, please, to the fourth page. Top of the page. Professor Bloom reported that he'd given a talk on AIDS to the AGM of the Haemophilia Society. His impression was that haemophiliacs were not greatly concerned about AIDS. Whether that, of course, is a result of the advice or impression he was giving them may be a, 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 a matter for, for you to consider. Uh, and indeed, whether it's consistent with what's said elsewhere will be a matter for you to consider. We know then that at the, on the 1st of May 1983, there were various newspaper articles published. We've, we've already looked at a number of them um, in, a, in an earlier presentation which referred to two men in hospital in London and Cardiff suspected to be suffering from AIDS after routine transfusions for haemophilia. And that triggers um, contact between the Haemophilia Society and Professor Bloom. So if we have, please, CBLA 5060 underscore 158. It's a letter from Professor Bloom to the Reverend Alan Tanner, the chair of the Haemophilia Society. It says, Dear Alan, in response to David's telephone call over the weekend, I've drafted out a letter which is enclosed. I hope this is what you're looking for. 
I'm not too sure if David meant it would be circulated to members above both our signatures or just above yours, but either procedure would be acceptable to me. Please feel free to modify it as you wish. I am sorry about the inaccurate reports, particularly in the mail, and was shocked to learn of the lengths to which this reported, it says, perhaps reporter, had gone with the society. I hope you make headway with the press council. And we know there was indeed a complaint to the press council about the May 1983 article um, in the Mail on Sunday, although my recollection is that was a complaint made by Dr. Peter Jones um, rather than the Haemophilia Society. Um, there's then over the page a draft text from Professor Bloom, but rather than look at that, we'll look at the published version of the text, which is at DHSC three zeros one two two eight. And this is an important document, so I'm, I'm going to essentially read out um, um, what we have here. It's a publication by the Haemophilia Society on the 4th of May of 1983. And it says this, in view of the unduly alarmist reports on AIDS which appeared in the press over the weekend, we are writing to reassure members of the society about the true position. We had been in touch with Professor Arthur Bloom, uh, it sets out who he is, who's kindly written to us all as follows. And then this is the text from Professor Bloom. Reports from America of the acquired immune deficiency syndrome in persons with haemophilia are causing anxiety to members of this society and to their relatives. Pausing there, sir, the note we've looked at previously suggested that Professor Bloom's impression was that haemophiliacs were not greatly concerned. In any event, he, he identifies their anxiety and says this. Haemophiliacs, their parents and doctors, have always balanced the quality of life and the dangers from bleeding against the risks of treatment. We are no strangers to infective diseases such as hepatitis, which can be transmitted by factor concentrates. Recent evidence suggests that in this respect, at any rate, concentrates prepared from British blood are not necessarily safer than those prepared in the United States. Even so, we welcome the fact that the government is investing over £20 million in the Blood Products Laboratory at Elstree so that this country shall become self-sufficient in blood products. Bearing this in mind, it is important to consider the facts concerning AIDS and haemophilia. The cause of AIDS is quite unknown, and it has not been proven to result from transmission of a specific infective agent in blood products. And you'll note there again, sir, the use of the word proven. The number of cases reported in American haemophiliacs is small, and in spite of inaccurate statements in the press, we are unaware of any proven case in our own haemophiliac population. Pausing there, sir, of course, there was a case. The use of the word proven may again be significant but there was a case of a patient under Professor Bloom's own care in Cardiff at this time. Neither have any cases been reported from Germany, where massive amounts of American concentrates have been used for many years. As I indicated earlier, that's not correct that Professor Bloom may not at this time have known about those cases. Nevertheless, the situation is being closely monitored by the Haemophilia Centre directors and in a more general way by the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre in London, in addition, the importation of licensed blood products has always been strictly monitored and controlled. Thus, whilst it would be wrong to be complacent, it would equally be counterproductive to alter our treatment programmes radically. We should avoid precipitate action and give those experts who are responsible a chance continually to assess the situation. And then the publication continues, and this is the Reverend Tanner again, we're most grateful to Professor Bloom for this statement. If you have any questions, further questions about AIDS and your own treatment pro program, then of course your centre director will be able to help you. So that is the public message authored by Professor Bloom, sent out by the Haemophilia Society on the 4th of May. If we look, please, Henry, at PRSE 40353... And if we could zoom in on that, please, Henry. I know you've seen this document before, sir, as will others, but um, it, its date and content is significant. So it's um, a communicable disease report. Uh, and uh, if we go down the page, we can see the date. It's the week ending 6th of May 1983. So it's um, essentially around the same time as the uh, publication from the Haemophilia Society we've just looked at. And then this, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, Cardiff. 
acquired immune deficiency syndrome has been reported in a 20-year-old man with haemophilia in Cardiff. For three months, he has had oropharyngeal and esophageal candida infection and has recently been treated in hospital for epidemiochitis. I'm I sure mean. I'm pronouncing it wrongly, sir. Um, uh, he has lymphopenia and a low T helper suppressor ratio. There is no known underlying cause of immunosuppression. This is the first report of AIDS in a patient with haemophilia in the United Kingdom known to CDSC. So there doesn't appear to be any uncertainty in the uh, minds of CDSC that this is a case of AIDS. Presumably, but it is only an assumption, that is information that's been reported to it by Cardiff and Professor Bloom. Um, so just picking up on the point about cases in Germany, um, we know that on the 28th of April of 1983, the Council of Europe's Committee of Experts on Blood Transfusion and Immunohematology had published a report on AIDS in which it recorded that two cases in haemophiliacs had occurred in January. I'm not going to put that up, but the reference is DHSC 40717. Um, we then see... Further communications um, from uh, pharmaceutical companies to Professor Bloom. Um, this is at DHSC 301291. This is the 9th of May of 1983. It's a letter to Professor Bloom from the... Uh, uh, Managing Director of Travanol Laboratories in the UK. Dear Professor Bloom, I want to advise you of important developments and actions being taken by Highland Therapeutics and Travanol Laboratories in connection with the risks of AIDS. While the causative agent of this disease remains to be identified, some evidence suggests it is caused by a virus that can be transmitted by blood and certain blood products. And then it goes on in the next paragraph to identify that Highland Therapeutics recently became aware that one of its plasma donors had been identified as a possible victim of uh, AIDS, um, although it says um, no therapeutic products fractionated from plasma pools containing that donor's plasma had been shipped to Europe. Uh, and, and then the letter continues about the steps that were going to be taken or were being taken um, uh, by uh, Highland and Travanol. We then um, see further communications between the Haemophilia Society and Professor Bloom. So we can pick that up at CBLA 5060 underscore 044. We go to the second page first of all, please, Henry. We can see a letter from Mr. Waters to all members of the medical advisory panel, um, and Professor Bloom was one of the members of the uh, Haemophilia Society's medical advisory panel, uh, um, uh, as I think was Dr. Ritzer. I'll have to double check that. Uh, um, uh, it sets out how there's going to be a meeting um, in connection with current AIDS publicity uh, and that various matters were going to be raised including at B, an assurance that there'll be no immediate ban on the importation of US blood products. Uh, um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Finsberg, he was the junior minister, was he? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head. Well, I, I think you may find that he, he probably was at the DHS um, S. Yes, there are certainly references um, uh, in later communications with them meeting with ministers. Um, so that may be right. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll check, sir. Uh, and then we see that uh, Mr. Waters is saying the chairman's asked that, I think there's a we missing, we obtain any view that you may hold on those matters and also any other subjects which you feel we should raise at this time which relate specifically to AIDS. Um, and then um, we have the response um, on the first page of this document from Professor Bloom. Uh, thank you for your letter about AIDS. I'm glad to see you'll be meeting Jeffrey Finsberg on May the 20th, I think that is. 
I'm sure the present government has made a definite commitment to UK self-sufficiency in blood products, but I'm equally sure your strong representations about the other three points would be very appropriate. So you'll see there effectively Professor Bloom endorsing the Haemophilia Society's view that the government should be asked um, to give an assurance that there'll be no immediate ban on the importation of US blood products. There's then a reference to drawing the attention of the MRC, Medical Research Council, to AIDS and the desirability for funding for AIDS-related projects. Uh, and then there's a request to emphasise the essential need for increased regional funding for blood transfusion centres. And he says this, this will be even more necessary if there's any substantial demand for cryoprecipitate on the part of haemophiliacs. Such a demand could reduce the supply of available plasma at present funding levels and a considerable expansion of regional facilities will be needed in any case. So in terms of an, any opportunity to raise any other matter with the minister, these are the matters that Professor Bloom suggests are raised rather than uh, uh, not anything else. Um, if we then have, please, um, HSOC two zeros, two nine four seven six underscore zero two four, please. Um, this is a meeting of the Haemophilia Society's Executive Committee on the 12th of May 1983. If we go to the second page, please, Henry. Go down um, uh, towards the second half of the page under the heading B, AIDS. The chairman introduced the subject of the present AIDS scare in the UK and referred to the dossier of press cuttings. It was agreed that the coordinator should take appropriate steps in connection with the Mail on Sunday. It was noted that one centre director had already lodged a formal complaint. Uh, the chairman outlined his action in mailing his letter of the 4th of May 83 to the entire membership of the society. So that's the document we looked at uh, with the statement from Professor Bloom. And it was agreed unanimously that until there is evidence to prove otherwise, the society's policy would be to encourage members to, to continue with their present treatment programmes subject to the advice of their uh, centre directors uh, and that full support would be given to self-sufficiency in blood products at the earliest possible date. And then if we see the next line, couple of lines, please, Henry. So you're right about Mr Finsberg. A meeting with the minister, Mr Finsberg, had been uh, arranged, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see there that the advice from Professor Bloom has been um, shared with all members of the society uh, and maybe a reasonable inference to see it's, it, it, it has an influence on the society's um, response uh, to the AIDS crisis. Um, if we then go, please, to DHSC 301177. We see that on the 13th of May of 1983, there was a special meeting of haemophilia reference centre directors at St Thomas's Hospital. We can see who was present, Bloom, Crask, Hamilton, Kernoff, Ludland, Savage, Preston, Delamore, Ritzer, uh, and Dr Wolford from the Department of Health and, and Social Security. This is the first specially convened meeting um, that the haemophilia centre directors um, uh, held in order to consider the, the, the issue of AIDS, although as we've seen it had been discussed at a number of earlier routine meetings. Um, if we could go to the second page, please. Um, the first page contains an, an, an Professor Bloom's update of the position, and then on the second page we see what the reference centre directors decide. So in the, in the second main paragraph, beginning the steps to be taken, we see um, What's suggested is that if a patient develops the features of the full-blown con condition, um, there was insufficient information available to warrant changing the type of concentrate. And then in the next paragraph, with regard to general policy to be followed in the use of factor eight concentrates, it was noted that many directors have up until now um, uh, and then restricted their use of as crossed out and replaced with reserved or, and I'm not quite sure what the next word is, um, reserved National Health Service concentrates for children and mildly affected haemophiliacs. And it was considered it would be circumspect to continue with that policy 
It was also agreed that there was as yet insufficient evidence to warrant restriction of the use of imported concentrates in other patients. In view of the immense benefits of therapy, the situation should be kept under constant review. So that's the, the recommendation. In terms of general policy, it's a, we'll continue with what's, what many directors already do, it said, in relation to children and mildly affected haemophilia. Can I just come back to the underlying text for a moment? Yes. If we get rid of the bar, thank you. It's the, the last sentence of the paragraph at the top. Moreover, once the condition is fully developed, it seems to be irreversible. So there would seem to be no clinical benefit to be gained by changing to another type of factor eight. Would it be for me to consider whether uh, that corresponds with uh, what uh, I heard uh, from those who had been infected as to what they were told about the likely course of their condition? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, um, we'll see shortly that meeting resulted in the sending out in the following month of a letter to, to, to uh, Haemophilia Centre directors. But in the meantime, we can see at tab four uh, uh, sorry, at, at DHSC 301206. Um, on the 16th of May, Dr. Wolford wrote to Professor Bloom referring to a, a telephone conversation they'd had. The issue that she then refers to in this letter is about the possible need to institute new labelling requirements for factor eight concentrates derived from plasma um, uh, taken before the new FDA regulations came into force. The extent to which the conversation itself may have roamed more widely is, is not known, but there is in here another means of direct communication or another form of direct communication between Professor Bloom and those at the, within the department um, uh, instrumental in, in shaping government policy. And we have a letter then from Dr. Bloom to Dr. Wolford, Professor Bloom to Dr. Wolford, at HCDO 603 underscore 122. Um, it's a letter of the 17th of May, and if we look at um, about... Uh, well, we'll, look at, we'll pick it up in the second sentence. Um, this, refers to, this refers to the possibility that some of the American Factor VIII manufacturers may consider it advantageous to export products which were made from plasma collected before March the 24th rather than retain them for domestic use. You're no doubt aware that on that date, the American Food and Drug Administration circulated all American establishments collecting source plasma, giving revised guidelines for collecting plasma with regard to AIDS. I have some misgivings concerning the possibility that stocks held by the manufacturers and source plasma collected before that date will be preferentially exported. In other words, the potential dumping of, of, of products that wouldn't be used in the American, uh, for American haemophiliacs um, and foreign markets. Whilst I do not wish to overstate the risk from imported American factor eight concentrates, nevertheless, I think that haemophilia center directors would wish to be reassured that factor eight concentrates imported are at least up to the standards recommended for use in the USA. Um, we then so go to an internal Cardiff document, um, which, which um, many may not have seen before. It's WITN 4029010. This is a document that's been provided to the inquiry by Professor Peter Collins, who, as you know, sir, is the current Haemophilia Centre Director in Cardiff, um, uh, um, and only joined Cardiff a number of years after the events with which we're currently concerned. Uh, but he refers to a protocol apparently written in May 1983, and that is this document. So it's understood to be a Cardiff-generated document. It's called Haemophilia Treatment Policy Guidelines, May 1983. And we'll see what it sets out here. So for mild haemophiliacs and von Willebrands, use DDABP um, for minor lesions expected to need only one to two days treatment. 
B, use cryoprecipitate or NHS factor concentration for other lesions. Um, and then examples given, NHS factor concentrate for outpatient mild haemophiliacs. So for that first category, mild haemophiliacs and von Willebrand's DDABP, cryoprecipitate or, or NHS factor eight. Children with severe haemophilia is the second category. Use cryo or NHS factor eight as in 1B above. Three, adults with severe haemophilia use cryoprecipitate for inpatient treatment where feasible. Those who've never received imported concentrate should, where possible, only receive NHS concentrate when concentrate therapy is needed. Other patients should continue to receive imported concentrate as previously described. Um, patients with haemophilia B should receive NHS factor nine concentrate as needed. Then there's a reference to um, um, FIBA. Uh, and then under the heading general points, try to maintain patients on same material and same batch if possible to reduce donor exposure. Remember that even NHS factor eight will transmit, sorry, will transmit non-A, non-B hepatitis. Use DDABP or cryo where possible for mild hepatitis susceptible individuals. Over the page, try yeah, to it, avoid- Should there be a, a, a stroke, do you think, between mild uh, and susceptible? Is it two categories, susceptible patients and mild uh, haemophiliacs? Or, or is it, uh, are the two running together? It, I, it, it could be either, sir. Mm. Uh, it, it would perhaps make, make make more sense for it to be two separate categories, but mm. um, when the, the document itself doesn't seem to make that distinction. And then over the page, try to avoid introducing a dose of commercial concentrate during a treatment episode which mm. has already commenced on NHS material unless there is good reason for changing. Um, and then the date that is given is May the 18th, 1983. Now, you will no doubt sir, wish to consider whether these guidelines mirror what was actually done in relation to patients at the Cardiff Haemophilia Centre. In particular, in relation to the position of children, mild haemophiliacs and those who had not previously received imported concentrates and whether these guidelines were adhered to. There is no name on these guidelines but it would seem inconceivable that they could have been produced in May 1983 for Cardiff usage without Professor Bloom's knowledge. Uh, and the, uh, it, would it be for me to consider whether uh, the item at C for adults with severe haemophilia, where the guidelines say that cryoprecipitate should be used for inpatient treatment where feasible, um, whether that corresponds to uh, what was being said uh, nationally, which was yes. continue with whatever treatment you've been having. Yes, absolutely. The, the, there are two ways in which you may wish to, 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 a number of ways in which you may wish to utilize this document, sir. One is the inferences you may draw from it as to what uh, Professor Bloom um, uh, may have thought was the the, the true extent of the risk. Um, the, secondly, a, a comparison between this and what was actually being done, and you'll be able to draw information from that from the many witness statements that, 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 that you have seen. Um, and the third will be to compare this with what was then said nationally, and we'll look in, 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 in a few minutes at the document that was sent to uh, Haemophilia Centre directors, which is much less detailed and much less prescriptive than this. Um, but before we do that, um, we see um, a document, PRSC 303701, which is a letter dated the 23rd of May 1983 from Professor Bloom to Dr. Bolton. Um, should have said for, for any who, who don't know because I've referred to him by name already he was the deputy director of the regional blood transfusion service uh, in Edinburgh um, and uh, we see it's a response to to a letter uh, um, 
uh, and Professor Bloom says, uh, refers to the special meeting of Haemophilia Reference Centre directors, most of the recommendations which you suggest have in fact been incorporated by the Haemophilia Reference Centre directors. We have not laid down hard and fast regulations since the details of treatment will depend upon local circumstances. I do not think that anyone is complacent about the situation, but I think that we all agree that it would be counterproductive to ban the importation of blood products at this moment. We are, however, taking steps to recommend that imported products from the USA at least meet with the new FDA regulations. Your comments about the use of cryoprecipitate and NHS factor VIII concentrate have been incorporated into our advice although at the moment we are not rigidly differentiating between cryoprecipitate and NHS concentrate as far as severely affected patients are concerned at uh, any rate. So pausing there, you'll have seen that, in fact, from the document that we just looked at. There appears to be an assumption that there may be no great difference between cryoprecipitate and NHS concentrate in terms of risk of AIDS, which will be a matter that you'll no doubt wish to consider. Um, and then with regard to, uh, and then I'm not quite sure what the uh, verb there is, um, that might be deferral of home treatment for new patients. This is a matter for further discussion. The Haemophilia Society have expressed concern we're not expanding uh, the home treatment programme with sufficient vigour. Um, and then... Um, um, we, uh, we don't, I think, need to... Um, look at it, but there's an internal minute from Dr. Bolton in which he says he thinks that Arthur's, that's Professor Bloom's, letter is not unreasonable, um, and that's dated the 30th of May 1983. The, 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 the um, second from last sentence, the Haemophilia Society have expressed concern that we're not expanding the home treatment. What's the word in Britain? Pro, so it's project has been crossed out, and I, I think that might be programme in its place, but I'm not yes, sure. Yes, I think it looks like that, with sufficient vigour. Yes. Um, so the Hemophilia Society were wishing, um, in effect, factor concentrate to be more used. Well... Uh, that is, freeze-dried factor concentrate. Um, certainly, based upon this letter, suggesting that there should be more home treatment... It's also right that the majority of home tre treatment by this time was with concentrates. But very little would be cryoprecipitate. Very little cryoprecipitate by this time. But, of course, cryoprecipitate had been successfully used for home treatment in the 1970s, not least by Dr. Dormandy at the Royal Free Hospital. Yes. Um, um, so it, um, whether the Haemophilia Society expressly had in mind uh, concentrates um, or, or whether they'd well, given it, any it consideration may, It may to have that implication. Yes, it may. Um, uh, and then um, uh, we know that Professor Bloom wrote to Armour on the 23rd of May 1983, again raising the concern about the possibility of what he called preferential exportation of non-FDA compliant material um, to the UK. Um, there is then... If we look at BAYP 602 underscore 183, this is a communication from Qatar to Dr. Fowler at the Department of Health. But it's instructive for present purposes because we see how the effect of Professor Bloom's statements to the Haemophilia Society are, are having um, a wider effect. Um, uh, so um, the author of this letter uh, uh, um, is, says, first of all, on the first page to Dr. Fowler, picking it up in the third paragraph, last sentence, so penultimate sentence, refers to recent examples in the mail, and that's of what's called sensationalistic and erroneous reporting. As a result, false conclusions are arrived at and patient treatment as well as product supply are endangered. He says the facts about AIDS are very limited. Two, the etiological agent is unknown. It's not known whether it's a virus. 
three. Hence, it can only be an assumption that AIDS can be transmitted by certain blood products. This has not been shown. Also, it's unclear whether the syndrome contracted by haemophiliacs really is the same as the AIDS syndrome contracted by other high-risk groups. So that's the, the lobbying from Qatar of the Department of Health. But if we go over the page... Um, sorry, I should just pick it up at the beginning of the, the, the first page. My apologies. As medicine and the plasma suppliers, commercial and NHS, struggle to find the correct actions to take to exclude the elusive AIDS donor, it is imperative that the supply of products, in particular factor eight, not be reduced to levels where patients cannot be treated. And then he says this. The statement by Professor Bloom in the attached communication from the Haemophilia Society is particularly pertinent. So the, the, the wider ripples or effect there of, of, of Professor Bloom's pronouncement. Um, um, and we see that also in an intern, further internal uh, cutter communications where reference to Professor Bloom's statement is repeated. Um, there's a further meeting of the CBLA attended by Professor Bloom and Dr. Ritzer on the, tw on the 21st of June, 1983. And we'll just look at it briefly. It's PRSC 302741. We'll, we'll see from the list of attendees there that they in include Professor Bloom and Dr. Ritzer, um, Dr. Wolfer from the DHSS and others. Under the heading AIDS at the bottom of the page, we're told the chairman outlined the problems caused by AIDS since it appeared, and if we can go to the next page, to be transmitted through blood and blood products, and then it should be considered by the committee. So um, a statement there... Um, from Dr. Gunson, as chair of the CBLA, the AIDS appeared to be transmitted through blood and blood products. This is June 1983 now. And then there is a discussion about the possibility of a circular from the transfusion service um, and the question uh, of research uh, to be undertaken. So if we then um, move to what was sent out to Haemophilia Centre directors by way of guidelines following that, that special meeting in May, HCDO 40270 So this is 24th of June 1983. Dear blank, but we, we know that it was sent to, to Haemophilia Centre directors. Uh, it's authored by Professor Bloom as chair of the Haemophilia Centre Directors' Organisation and Dr Ritzer as secretary of that organisation. It refers to the, the special meeting on the 13th of May. It says this, so far one possible case has been reported to our organisation. And again, so you may wish to consider in due course whether that's a correct characterisation by this time of the Cardiff case as being a possible case. Goes, the sentence continues, this patient conforms to the definition published by the CDC but cannot be considered as a definite case. We're not aware of any other definable patients amongst the UK haemophilic population. And then it sets out recommendations. One, for mildly affected patients with haemophilia A or von Willebrand's disease and minor lesions, treatment with DDAVP should be considered. Because of the increased risk of transmitting hepatitis by means of large pool concentrates in such patients, this is, in any case, the usual practice of many directors. Two, for treatment of children and mildly affected patients or patients unexposed to imported concentrates, many directors already reserve supplies of NHS concentrates, cryoprecipitate or freeze-dried, and it would be circumspect to continue this policy. So... Pausing there, so you'll see the way in which it's there characterised is consider DDAVP in the circumstances set out in paragraph one. For children, mild haemophiliacs or, or previously untreated patients, circumspect. Well, not previously untreated, policy. previously untreated with imported concentrates. Import with imported concentrates, sorry, so yes, you're right. So um, it, it falls short of being an instruction. Um, uh, it's a suggestion that it would be circumspect to continue with an existing policy. And then it continues, it was agreed that there is as yet insufficient evidence to warrant restriction of the use of imported concentrates in other patients 
in view of the immense benefits of therapy, but the situation will be constantly reviewed. Um, and then reference is made to two additional points that have been drawn to their attention since the meeting of the 13th of May. The first was um, treatment of patients with haemophilia B, and it said they're logical to continue to use our normal supplies of NHS concentrate. And then the second concerns the proposed trials of hepatitis reduced at factor eight at concentrates. So, so that's the guidance <coughs> issued in, in those terms to, to haemophilia centre directors in, in mid-1983. Um, the next key event involving Professor Bloom is again on the national level. It's his attendance at the meeting of the Subcommittee on Biological Products of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines, 13th of July, 1983. And we can um, pick that up at ARCH 301710. So we looked, I think, in the course of the knowledge of risk presentation at the agenda and, and some preliminary material for this meeting. These are the minutes of the meeting itself. We can see it's chaired by Dr. J. Smith, various other attendees then set out, and then Professor Bloom, Dr. Krauss, Dr. Galbraith, Dr. Gunston, Dr. Maltimer attend the, the morning session and picking it up under the heading confidentiality and announcements, the chairman welcomed Professor Bloom, etc., etc., the others and the DHSS officials who were attending the meeting for item five um, on the agenda only. He said this item would be considered first. The chairman reminded members and guests that the material they received was confidential and should not be disclosed outside the meeting. And then if we go over the page, please, to the second page, Henry. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Um, it said the subcommittee's consideration of the question of AIDS and licensed blood products was augmented by the following expert advisors, and Professor Bloom is the first there listed. Um, it then said consideration was given to the current information available on incidence and epidemiology, etiology, and related factors. Strategies for limiting or eliminating risks from blood products were examined together with possible practical measures. Um, and then we see the conclusions of the committee there set out. I, I won't go through all of them. It, it's clearly a, a, a key event and a key document um, that, that you'll no doubt look at many times. Um, but with the main points, 5.1, the cause of AIDS is unknown, but an infectious etiology seems likely. Um, 5.2, patients who repeatedly receive blood clotting factor concentrates appear to be at risk but the evidence so far available suggests that this risk is small. The risk appears to be greatest in the case of products derived from the blood of homosexuals and IV drug abusers resident in areas of high incidence and in those who repeatedly receive concentrates in high dosage. Bal balanced against the risks of AIDS and the, of other infections transmitted by blood products are the benefits of their use in the case of haemophilia, they're life-saving. Then consideration is given in 5.3 to the possibility of withdrawing clotter factor concentrates and replacing it with cryoprecipitate. The conclusion there set out, and no doubt you'll want to explore this in due course, um, sir, as to what the basis of this was. It was concluded that this is not feasible in the UK on grounds of supply. Then the possibility was, is considered of withdrawing US preparations from the UK, and that's rejected as not at present feasible on grounds of supply. It's also said that the perceived level of risk does not at present justify serious consideration of such a solution. Um, top of the next page, we see that the subcommittee was informed that the UK Haemophilia Centre directors have adopted a policy for use of US Factor 8 in order to minimise risks as far as possible. Now, that information must be information provided to the subcommittee by Professor Bloom. Well, that seems reasonable, at least. He's the only haemophilia clinician who addresses them as an expert advisor. You will no doubt wish to consider, sir, whether the document we've just looked at, the guidelines, does constitute a policy for the use of factor eight that minimizes risks as far as possible. Um, there's then discussion about the um, issue about plasma collected pre the FDA regulations of the 23rd of March, 1983. Um, uh, a viral inactivation um, as, a, as a future prospect is, uh, is discussed in 5.6. Uh, and then um, hepatitis reduced 
or so-called hepatitis reduced um, product and issues relating to the hepatitis B vaccine were then considered. Um, so that, that's the decision of the um, Subcommittee on Biological Products of the Committee on the Safety of Medicines. Uh, uh, and um, you, um, you will no doubt wish to consider the role that Professor Bloom may have played in shaping um, that decision. Um, if we could then just have, please, DHSC 301207, please, Henry. We can see this is a letter written on the 27th of July by the chair of the committee to Professor Bloom. Dear Arthur, um, the Committee on Safety of Medicine considered the AIDS question last Thursday and Friday and endorsed the recommendations that came from the subcommittee. Uh, the chairman of the committee, Sir Abraham Goldberg, asked me to convey his thanks and those of the committee to you for the help you gave. I'm afraid that it's necessary to ask that the recommendations remain confidential largely because of the commercial implications. Now, it, it may perhaps be of later significance that the Thursday and Friday, were the, I, on my uh, understanding of the calendar, the 21st and 22nd uh, of July. You there may right, have sir? been, well, there was an intervening meeting um, before the uh, Congress of the USA, I think, in between the subcommittee uh, on the and, 13th and that of meeting. Yes. Yes. What additional material was considered by the committee in addition to the material from the subcommittee, which we've just looked at? I don't think we're, is, is it, it's not clear from the materials I currently have available, but uh, again, we'll, we'll be exploring that with government decision makers in due course. Um, uh, we then see um, the position of the Haemophilia Society in, in mid-July 1983, HSOC 029476 underscore 026. So the, the date of the meeting, 14th of July, is apparent from um, the uh, first page. If we go to the second page, again, we can see the influence of Professor Blue. So under the heading AIDS, we can see the chairman introduced this subject and commented upon the WFH, that's the World Federation for Haemophilia Medical Board report presented at Stockholm by Dr. Shelby Dutrieu. This report carried the same essential message as that sent to our members in early May of this year. And, and then there's a dis discussion about a resolution from the Southern Group of the Haemophilia Society. Um, and then, um, we see this, the executive committee were unanimous in their view that the position in the UK remains as it did on the 4th of May when the chairman wrote to all society members along with a statement from Professor Bloom. It was agreed that the coordinator should write to Professor Bloom, giving him an opportunity to write again, amending any statements in that letter. Um, so we'll, we'll see that the invitation was made to Professor Bloom. Do you want to update or change anything you said in your 4th of May um, 1983 a communication um, and a letter was duly sent to Professor Bloom on the 19th of July um, of, of 1983 uh, um, giving him the opportunity to issue any amending statement I, I won't put it up on screen sir but the reference um, for your note is BPLL 301351 underscore 084 and then we, we will look at Professor Bloom's reply Henry, this is CBLA 5062 underscore 053. If we zoom in, please, so that we can read that. 25th of July 1983, dear David, Professor Bloom writes, with regard to the status of AIDS in the UK, I agree with you that there hasn't been any major change. And then he refers to the recommendations of the World Federation of Haemophilia Medical Board. Um, seemed to me to be clearly benign, not very conscientious. If anything, it errs in recommending too little, but I don't think we need to emphasise this to the society members. I'm not convinced that much is to be gained by circulating them again at the present time. For your information, I'm 
enclosing a copy of a letter which Dr Ritzer and I have circulated to Haemophilia Centre directors. That's no doubt the June 1983 guidelines. So um, uh, uh, offered the opportunity to update or amend his statement in light of any subsequent developments. That, that is Professor Bloom's response. Um, uh, um, there's a further letter from uh, the Reverend Tanner on the 26th of July to, to Professor Bloom. Um, perhaps look at this because, again, it, it shows the extent of the Haemophilia Society's reliance upon Professor Bloom's advice, DHSC 301246. Um, uh, m m my dear Arthur, etc., etc. If we go to the second paragraph, um, he, he expresses that we were very grateful indeed for your preparing a statement for us so quickly. That's the 4th of May 1983 document, because that gave us a definite society policy regarding AIDS and helped to allay a good deal of anxiety among our members. So we see there the role of Professor Bloom's statement in shaping haemophilia society policy. Um, and its wider impact upon, upon members. And then if we scroll down, please, um, Henry, to the bottom half of the page, um, we can see uh, the penultimate paragraph. We've circulated to the groups the paper presented by Dr. Shelby Dutrich, but I wonder whether following any conversation you may have had in Stockholm, you'd wish to add anything to the statement which you prepared for us, or whether you think that this is still sufficient without any amendment. So he's asked again, this time by the Reverend Tanner, do you want to amend or add anything? And his response is CBLA 5060 underscore 050. Do you need that again, Henry? CBLA 50. 60 underscore 050. Great. Uh, we can see there Professor Bloom's answer the 2nd of August 1983 to the Reverend Tanner is effectively no. He says, with regard to a further circular on AIDS, I doubt if anything is needed at the present time since there has been little development. And again, you'll, you'll no doubt wish to consider, sir, whether that's um, a, a fair r reflection um, uh, of events um, it, between May and uh, August of 1983. Uh, so I note the time. Um, I think we're, I'm going to move to September of 1983, and um, so that might be a convenient point at which to stop. Yes, well, very well. We'll, we'll take a break then until 2 o'clock. So 2 o'clock, if you please. <laughs>